All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the Duwamish people and the land itself. So welcome to our virtual event space. My name is Allie. I'm a bookseller at our Lake Forest Park location, and I'm your host for this evening. I am so excited to be introducing Greg Peters here to discuss his book, Our National Forests, Stories from America's Most Important Public Lands. But before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I want to quickly thank you all so very much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. And as much as we miss having these events in our bookstore, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and for buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. If you haven't gotten your hands on a copy of the book already and you would like to, I will be linking books in the chat all evening. Uh, for those of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local, we of course do ship. So go ahead and follow that link over to our website. Uh, while you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months. And if you'd like to check or if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. Speaking of social media, if you'd like to check out some of our past virtual events, you can find most of them on our YouTube channel, including this event within the next couple days. So if you'd like to see our other virtual events or share this one, uh, you can go ahead and track us down over there. Uh, this evening, we are here for about an hour, and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. Uh, it is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause um, and connecting with each other. I absolutely invite you to share where you are tuning in from in the chat. But when it comes time for questions, please don't, do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. While you're in our chat and question spaces, I wanna remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Uh, for anyone interested, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the top or bottom of your screen. Uh, just select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, which can happen in the world of Zoom, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them. And we appreciate so much your patience and understanding. All right. So now is the time for us all to settle in because without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Greg M. Peters, the former director of communications at the National Forest Foundation, where he edited the foundation's magazine, Your National Forest. His writing has appeared in National Parks, High Country News, Down East, Big Sky Journal, Outside Bozeman, and Adventure Journal. He is the author of the Falcon Guide, Stand Up Paddling Montana, and of course, the book of the evening, Our National Forest, Stories from America's Most Important Public Lands, which tells the stories of our national parks and the people who keep them alive and thriving, whether it's citizen scientists tracking wildlife populations, dedicated members of the Forest Service overseeing sustainable timber harvests, or everyday advocates for responsible usage and equitable access. So thank you so much, Greg, for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this presentation. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be listening. The same goes for all of you in the audience. I will be in the chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our author. So welcome. Thank you so much, Ali. It's really great to be here with you all. Thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. Um, yeah, so great intro, Ali. Really appreciate that so much. Um, 
yeah, I, uh, I'm really excited to be talking about this book, Our National Forests, Stories from America's Most Important Public Lands. Uh, really appreciate what independent booksellers like Third Place Books do uh, for authors, for readers. Um, so um, big kudos to them for hosting me tonight. And uh, I really appreciate you all uh, joining. Um, I did create a, a presentation for this uh, for, for tonight. Um, so I've got a PowerPoint. Uh, one of the main reasons I did that um, was to to highlight some of the uh, amazing places that, that our national forests include. Uh, these landscapes stretch from Alaska to Puerto Rico, um, and there's just some stunning uh, scenery. And so the book is filled with uh, 150 photographs, some historic, uh, some current uh, that uh, that help shed some uh, some some light on on how beautiful some of these places are and some of the histories um, and so in this presentation uh, I included a lot of those photographs um, and I wanted to be able to share those with you so um, without further ado I am going to share my screen um, and hopefully this goes relatively smoothly we have practiced this but uh, nonetheless so here we go and um, thank you so much again Okay, hopefully, <clears throat> and maybe Al, you can let me know that you are seeing a full screen of my presentation before I get going. Screen too share success. <laughs> awesome. All right, so I am Greg Peters. Um, here are a couple photos of me doing what I like to do. Uh, I love getting out on our national forest. I live in Missoula, Montana, um, and we are super fortunate here uh, to be almost entirely surrounded by national forests. Um, some of these shots are from the Lolo, uh, actually the, the, the first two there on the top and um, the, the one of me backpacking. Uh, overlooking the lake or from the Lolo. Uh, and then uh, one is from the Flathead National Forest um, uh, on the Bob Marshall Wilderness, um, which is a really cool spot. So um, again, uh, thank you all. I just wanted to provide a little intro uh, to me and in, in some of the ways that I like to get out on national forests before I, I really dig in. Okay, so uh, I often start uh, talking about national forests with uh, with a quick primer on what national forests are. Um, I was fortunate enough to work at a conservation nonprofit called the National Forest Foundation for about eight years, from 2010 until 2018. And uh, I ended up being the director of communications there for the last several years of, of my time there. And uh, we often started with this conversation. What are national forests? How are they different than national parks? Uh, how are they managed? Where are they? Those types of questions. And so um, while some of you are probably more familiar Familiar with national forests than maybe uh, the average American, uh, I still wanted to get started there. So our national forests are, are public lands, obviously. They're managed by the U.S. Forest Service, um, which is an agency housed under the Department of Agriculture, um, and they are multiple use lands. So they're, uh, they're managed for a whole bunch of different things. I'll, I'll speak a little more specifically about that in just a moment. And as I mentioned, um, they're really diverse, um, both in terms of uh, the resources that exist on them, um, the way that they're managed, um, and the way that they look. There are, are all kinds of different ecosystems, um, all kinds of different wildlife, all kinds of different geographies. Um, that these national that our national forests encompass. So uh, that multiple use concept. What are national forests managed for? Um, they're managed for all kinds of things. They're managed for uh, natural resource development, things like timber harvesting, um, oil and gas, and hard rock mining. Um, they're managed for grazing, so cattle and sheep. Um, in fact, uh, roughly half of uh, of the landscape of our national forests is considered uh, rangeland, um, which I think is a, a pretty interesting statistic that folks may not be uh, all that familiar with. Um, of course, they're managed for recreation. That's probably how a lot of folks listening in right now uh, have come to know their national forests and, and are able to get out on them. Um, you know, think ski areas, think uh, motorized recreation, non-motorized recreation, um, really all, all kinds of recreation um, are all available on our national forests. Um, they're also, of course, managed for fish and wildlife habitat. Um, they're managed for water provision. Um, in fact, um, 3,400 communities and about 68 million Americans, almost one fifth of the country, um, including uh, you all there in Seattle, get your national forests, or excuse me, get your water from national forests. Um, and of course, um, there are other ecosystem services that they provide, uh, carbon storage, pollution control, flood control, um, all kinds of different things as well in that, in that broad ecosystem bucket. Okay. 
So before we can really talk about where National Forest came from, the, the history of National Forest, I think it's important to understand a little bit um, how uh, some of the private lands in America in, in the 1800s were managed. Um, and I use this uh, photo from the book of, of uh, some logs stacked and ready for Holland to the mill from Michigan uh, as a good example of that. So um, most uh, of the landscape in the East was privately owned um, up until uh, 1911, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and the folks who uh, established our national forests, some of those politicians and, and policymakers in the late 1800s, the mid to late 1800s and early 1900s, they, uh, they saw what had happened to some of the Eastern forests and the Midwestern forests. And that is that they had been pretty heavily clear cut. Um, fire swept through, uh, burned up the shrubs and, and the other vegetation that was left after timber, timber harvesting. Um, it kind of uh, made the soil a little difficult to farm. And so those lands were in pretty tough shape. And, uh, and a lot of those folks uh, didn't want to see that happen to lands out west. Um, so a brief history, um, and I know there's a lot of words and a lot of dates on here, but I'll try to run through this pretty quickly. Um, you know, think uh, post-Civil War. Uh, America was spreading west. Um, we had, uh, we, were, we were still obviously fighting Native Americans, um, and that's a whole nother uh, story that I'll get into a little bit. But nonetheless, America was moving west, um, and the government uh, effectively owned most of the western U.S. Um, they were considered public domain lands, and so they could be divided up uh, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, homesteaders had access to them. Um, they could be given to states and territories. They could be uh, given to private enterprise, um, sold off. <clears throat> But uh, but really, the government didn't know uh, just exactly what, what resources were out there. So in 1876, they set up the Office of Special Agent in the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture to assess the extent and condition of forests in the western U.S. Um, it wasn't until 1891 that Congress passed uh, some legislation called the Forest Reserve Act that allowed the president to designate some of those lands from the public domain and, uh, and turn them into forest reserves. So they pulled them out of that uh, opportunity for homesteading, uh, opportunity for, for trans, uh, transference to private ownership or, or to states, uh, and created forest reserves. Um, it wasn't for another few years until Congress actually instructed uh, the Department of Interior, which, which at the time managed the forest reserves, on how to manage them. And uh, I, I pulled this quote from uh, what's considered the Organic Act uh, of the Forest Service, um, even though the Forest Service wasn't actually created until uh, seven years later, um, or eight years later, excuse me. Um, but anyway, this line I think is really important and, and continues uh, through today in the way that the Forest Service manages these lands. Um, so they're, they they were set up to improve and protect the forest within the reservation, that's the forest reserve, um, and improve and protect basically means protect from illegal timber harvesting and wildfire. Um, they were set up to secure favorable conditions of water flows, uh, which is a really critical piece that we'll talk about a little bit later, and they were set up to furnish a continuous supply of timber for the use and necessities of citizens of the United States. So already here, back in 1897, you start to see that multiple use concept um, and you start to see that be articulated by Congress. Um, fast forward another few years, President Teddy Roosevelt pushes through the Transfer Act, uh, which establishes the Forest Service shifts management from uh, Department of Interior to the Department of Agriculture. Um, and uh, he brings on Gifford Pinchot uh, to manage uh, the Forest Service there in 1905. Um, in 1911, uh, the Weeks Act is passed, and that uh, allows, for the first time, the federal government to buy private lands, um, primarily east of the Mississippi River, um, and to uh, bring those into the federal estate. And we'll talk a little bit more about, um, about why that law was passed and, and what that ended up doing. Um, but that was really where we saw um, the Eastern National Forest start to come about. And then in 1937, um, the, the really exciting, uh, excitingly named uh, Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act um, did a couple things. Um, and uh, for our purposes, the most important thing that it did was uh, it again authorized the federal government to purchase private lands, this time um, in the Great Plains, uh, particularly in the, in the Southern Great Plains, um, where these lands had been pretty ravaged by uh, poor farming practices, drought, and, uh, and effectively turned into uh, what became known as the Dust Bowl. Um, and then uh, it wasn't until 1960 that those lands um, that the federal government purchased and restored um, actually became incorporated into the, the national forest system as uh, national grasslands, um, which, which we know of and have today. 
So that history gets us to where we're at today. Um, we've got this map here, shows uh, all the green, which are all the national forests. Um, if you look up there in the Pacific Northwest, you can certainly see that uh, Seattle uh, is pretty proximate to a lot of green, which I'm sure you all uh, deeply appreciate. Um, and if you can find Missoula there, uh, we also are, are pretty fortunate. Um, the gold yellow uh, blocks on this map are the national grasslands. Um, and as you can see, they are mostly in the Midwest. Um, and as you can see, the forest stretch from Alaska all the way to Puerto Rico, um, which has a, a tropical uh, forest. Um, all told, there's 193 million acres uh, in this system. Um, there are, uh, that's split up into 175 units, um, <clears throat> which is a administrative title for a national forest or a grassland. Um, they, as I mentioned, stretch from Alaska to Puerto Rico. And as I mentioned, they're not all in fact forests. Um, so I'm going to cycle through a few photos from the book here for the next uh, minute or two, just to give you some concept for those folks that haven't had the chance to, to either see or, uh, or visit these places, just how diverse some of these landscapes are. Um, so the Coconino is down in Arizona, and uh, it's pretty famous for Red Rock, uh, including Cathedral Rock, um, which is just a, an amazing spot. Um, you've got forests uh, like this one in, in uh, the Ocala, which is in Florida, um, where there are these amazing freshwater springs like Silver Glen Springs, um, which provide recreational and, and freshwater resources uh, for wildlife. Pretty cool spot. Um, this doesn't look like a forest at all. It is uh, the Dakota Prairie grasslands. Uh, pretty much not a tree in sight here. Um, and so again, you can see some of that diversity uh, represented here uh, by our national grasslands. Uh, I mentioned Puerto Rico uh, has a, uh, the uh, nation's only uh, tropical forest, um, and that is called El Yunque. And it has a really cool back history. Um, it was actually set aside by the King of Spain when uh, Puerto Rico was uh, owned uh, by Spain before it became a uh, territory of the United States. And uh, Puerto Ricans have a, a really, um, a lot of love for El Yunque and, and a lot of pride in it. Um, and they work really hard to, to take care of it. It's a pretty cool spot, though I've never been there yet. Um, this is a little closer to you all, um, but again, I think it highlights that that uh, that diversity. This is the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, um, which is both unique in uh, in the geography, the geology, the topography, and also in the the management scheme. Um, it, it's a really unique uh, set of lands uh, that happen to be managed by the Forest Service. Actually, um, let's see. Moving a little farther south, we've got the Angeles National forest, you know, this is the backdrop to, to Hollywood. It's a uh, backdrop to 15 million people who live uh, within about an hour and a half of this forest. Um, it's got a Mediterranean kind of chaparral ecosystem. So pretty different from the lush uh, temperate rainforests that you all are, are familiar with there uh, in Seattle and, and on the Olympic, but nonetheless, a, a really cool place. Um, again, we're back in Arizona on the Coronado here where uh, saguaro cacti uh, make up the forest. Um, and lest we all think the Midwest is, uh, is uh, cornfields and farms, uh, the Shawnee uh, National Forest in Illinois uh, definitely has some pretty cool and pretty interesting uh, topography. This is a garden of the gods um, in, in the Shawnee. That's a pretty neat spot as well. Um, finally, uh, moving over to the east, we've got the White Mountain National Forest, which is in New Hampshire and, and Maine, um, you know, a hardwood uh, uh, forest, Appalachian style uh, hardwood forest uh, that's uh, particularly scenic in the fall. And then, uh, of course, had to throw in the Lolo, my uh, backyard forest, and, uh, and a photo that, uh, that really does emphasize the, the forest part of national forests. All right. <clears throat> so another spot. Um, that helps, uh, un helps us understand a little bit uh, the difference or, or what national forests are is the difference between national parks and national forests. Um, and so national parks are really um, kind of embody a vision of preservation that's articulated, uh, was articulated by John Muir, who probably a lot of you have heard of, um, whereas national forests embody uh, a vision of conservation that uh, was articulated by Gifford Pinchot. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and, and so, you know, you've got a, a little difference in the timing of the way that, um, that, that the agencies that are managed these were set up. You've got um, the Forest Service established in 1905. It's part of the Department of Agriculture. Um, currently, it has about 30,000 employees. Uh, you compare that to the National Park Service established in 1916. Uh, it is housed under the Department of Interior, and uh, it's only got, well, only, it's got about uh, 12,500 employees or so. Um, Let's see, you've got, uh, 
you got 193 million acres in the national forest system compared to about 85 million acres in the national park system. Um, and a lot of that is up in Alaska. So we tend to think of our national parks as being huge and, and, and uh, as being the, the main, you know, biggest set of public lands in this country, but actually um, they're really only about half of the national forests. Um, and then you look a little bit at, at some of the recreational opportunities on these two sets of public lands. Um, and I think uh, some of the differences really start to get stark here. Um, national forests have almost 160,000 miles of trail. Um, that's almost uh, includes almost 100,000 miles of non-motorized trails, 60,000 miles of motorized trail, um, and about 30,000 miles of wilderness trails. Um, you compare that to the Park Service in the latest stat that I could find from 2008, we've got about 12,000 miles of trail. And then how do we access those trails? Uh, how do we get into the woods, uh, get into these forests and these public lands? Well, we do that on roads. Uh, and uh, the Park Service maintains about 8,500 miles of roads. And uh, I wouldn't say the Forest Service maintains, but they are responsible for, in some level, um, 350,000 miles of roads, which is uh, something like 11 times the uh, interstate highway system. So start to see some of the real differences here. The national forests are just larger. Um, they've got twice the employees as the Park Service. Um, they've got a bit of a longer history. And, and this isn't a comparison in terms of one is better than the other, uh, just trying to provide some context uh, and, and some comparisons to a set of public lands that folks uh, do understand a little bit better, I think, than national forests. So again, I mentioned uh, John Muir, Gifford Pinchot. Um, these are really the, the two gentlemen who in a lot of ways helped shape uh, conservation in America um, and that sort of lowercase conservation, um, how we uh, steward our public lands and what they're used for. Um, and as I said, Pinchot, uh, he advocated for uh, this notion of uh, what, was, what became to be called the greatest good. And he borrowed from an English philosopher, a guy named Jeremy Bentham, um, who came up with the concept of utilitarianism, which is basically uh, something is, is moral, it's good if it's, uh, if it's useful to the greatest number of people. And so uh, <clears throat> Pinchot took that idea, he uh, kind of made it his own, and he, he uh, is credited with penning a letter um, to early forest rangers in the early 1900s, um, where he was uh, essentially instructing them on how to uh, how to manage national forests, and that instruction uh, basically has been uh, has been uh, pulled into this quote uh, that comes from this letter, and and um, it basically says, "Where conflicting interests must be reconciled, the question shall always be answered from the standpoint of the greatest good of the greatest number in the long run." And uh, that was his uh, sort of founding principle, his, his concept of conservation. Can we provide a sustainable uh, supply of timber to Americans? Uh, can we secure uh, favorable water flows? Can we provide wildlife habitat? Can we do all of those things at the same time? His answer was through, uh, his answer was yes, through, uh, through human ingenuity and engineering, et cetera, we can. Whether or not uh, he's going to be proven right over time, I think that's a bit of an open question, but uh, it's certainly something that um, that has uh, undergirded the Forest Service um, throughout its, its entire uh, history and, and continues uh, through that multiple use mandate to be a big part of what they try to do now. Um, one other way that uh, the national parks and national forests kind of coexist, um, a lot of national parks are surrounded or, or at least bordered by national forests. And uh, I think this uh, image here uh, is a really good uh, example of that, probably one of the best. Um, you've got Yellowstone National Park there in the dark green, uh, kind of in, in the upper center. Um, and it's surrounded by five different national forests. Um, and these, are, these exist in three different states. You've got Montana, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, um, and those five national forests. And, and they work together, you know, uh, wildlife move outside of Yellowstone. Um, you know, trees and, and, and other species uh, move outside of Yellowstone, um, as does uh, light pollution <laughs> and climate change certainly affects all of these. Um, but this whole zone is called the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. And it's really kind of managed as that. Um, it's managed as a huge ecosystem. It's not just uh, Yellowstone and, and Grand Teton, it's this whole ecosystem even though it's managed by different agencies um, with different mandates and, and, and different rules, um, they do work together to try to manage that as a, as a broad ecosystem. Okay. And I, I like to throw this photo in. This is from Colorado. Uh, these are the maroon bells on the White River National Forest. Um, and uh, I just think it evokes uh, 
that that stunning beauty that that uh, some of our national forests provide. Um, and I would argue that that certainly rivals any photograph from a national park. Okay, uh, from here I want to move in and talk uh, about the chapters in the book, the way I organized the book, uh, the topics that I covered. Um, <clears throat> and so. The first chapter in the book is called No Forest, No Water, and it talks about the creation of the eastern forests, which I mentioned earlier. Um, this photo is actually from a flood in Pittsburgh in 1908 that was uh, attributed to uh, deforestation in the, in the watersheds um, that, uh, that uh, overlaid the river here. I don't know actually which river it is that flooded, but nonetheless, Pittsburgh flooded and it was blamed on deforestation. Um, this gentleman is named John Weeks. Uh, the Weeks Act, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is named after him. Um, he is responsible for, uh, for pushing this through Congress. Uh, he was from New Hampshire, um, but he was a representative from Massachusetts uh, when, when the law was passed. And uh, he found a way uh, through the uh, Interstate Commerce Clause of the Constitution um, to draft a law that allowed the federal government to purchase private lands um, in the East and add those lands to the federal estate. And they were able to do that because uh, there, there was an understanding um, that the forests where the rivers originated from in the East had all been uh, pretty heavily cut over. And so water supplies were polluted, there was flooding, as I mentioned, um, and just downstream users were, were really suffering. And so uh, in order to control uh, flooding and navigability on these rivers uh, and thus uh, promote interstate commerce, uh, the federal government decided that it needed to purchase some of these uh, forested headwaters, restore the forests there, and, uh, and that would help facilitate trade. And that was the sort of legal hook that, uh, that allowed uh, the federal government to really for the first time purchase private lands and, uh, and, and bring those into the federal estate. So that's where we saw uh, the creation of the Eastern forests. That law was passed in 1911. Um, there was a commission, they studied, blah, blah, blah. And they ended up purchasing, I think, uh, close to 40 or more um, tracts of land, or, or they ended up purchasing a lot of tracts of land that are now uh, combined and, and managed as I think 40 some odd uh, Eastern national forests. Um, they were from New Hampshire, as I mentioned, down to Florida, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota. Uh, most of those forests come from uh, the Weeks Act. And that notion of water uh, is really important. Um, and I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that, um, you know, there's 68 million people, 3,400 communities across America that get their water from national forests. Um, of course, they're not the only ones uh, who get their water from national forests. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, we, you know, without that clean water coming from those forests, um, we would certainly be in a very different situation. And so one of the things the Forest Service is really focused on on uh, in the last couple of decades is ensuring that those forested watersheds uh, can continue to provide that good clean water for folks um, and those communities that rely on it. Um, in order to do that, in a lot of cases, they have to plant trees. And so uh, the next chapter I talk about in the book uh, is called Seeds of Reforestation. Uh, and it talks about the way that the Forest Service um, grows and plants uh, literally tens of millions of seedlings a year. Um, and in short, there are uh, about six Forest Service, forest service nurseries around the country, um, like this one, uh, which is in Coeur d'Alene, right between uh, Missoula and Seattle there on Highway 90. Um, it's actually right off the highway. You can almost see it from the highway. Um, and uh, this is a spot where the Forest Service uh, grows a lot of these trees. Um, they come from cone orchards uh, that the Forest Service maintains, um, where they grow trees specifically to produce cones. Those cones are then uh, put into all these contraptions. The seeds are harvested. The seeds are then uh, prepped for planting, or they're stored in these huge walk-in coolers. Um, and the agency can grow, uh, you know, millions of seedlings a year um, from the, the same elevation or the right elevation. Uh, the right species, the right zone, all that kind of stuff, uh, so that when a civil culturist needs to order 100,000 trees, 200,000 trees for a planting project, they can pick up the phone, they can call that nursery, and voila, within a couple months, those seedlings can arrive at that ready for planting. So where did this whole... Um, technical prowess that growing, growing, growing trees come from? Well, actually, it came from Nebraska, believe it or not. Um, and it came from this gentleman, Charles Bessie. Um, so <clears throat> he was a botanist 
and a botany professor uh, at the University of Nebraska uh, in the late, uh, late 18 and early 1900s. And he was convinced that uh, the Great Plains once uh, was forested. So he uh, bent, the, bent the year of some folks in the Forest Service um, and was able to get uh, a small uh, plot of land uh, through, uh, through a colleague of his at the university. And uh, the Forest Service gave him some seedlings and he started growing them uh, to see if he could in fact uh, reforest the Great Plains. Um, and here's a, a picture of some of their early efforts. Um, and uh, while certainly the Great Plains are not covered in trees now, um, Nebraska National Forest um, is one of the largest hand-planted forests in the country. Um, he was successful. I think it's uh, know, tens of thousands of acres, maybe 30,000 acres or so. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a forest, a real deal forest. Um, and so from that, uh, that early effort there in Nebraska, um, we had this really cool um, kind of uh, modern slash... Um, analog, uh, digital slash analog uh, tree planting and, and, and seedling uh, production program uh, that the Forest Service maintains. It's a neat story. Um, kind of sticking with Nebraska in some respects, but, but uh, shifting topics a little bit, um, or at least sticking with the Midwest, but shifting topics a little bit. Um, the next uh, chapter in the book uh, talks about uh, the grasslands, uh, the national grasslands and where they came from. Um, and I include in that chapter um, a, a unique uh, example of the national grasslands, and that is Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie, um, which is about an hour south of Chicago um, near Joliet, Illinois. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that in just a second, but um, to, to go back a little bit to, to from the Dust Bowl, um, I'm sure most of the listeners are familiar with the Dust Bowl, at least peripherally, you know, uh, the, the Great Plains suffered drought in the 1930s. Um, farming practices plowed up the topsoil, it blew away, uh, you ended up with scenes like this. Um, <clears throat> in the 1930s through the New Deal, uh, FDR authorized, uh, as I mentioned, through the Bankhead-Jones Act, um, the opportunity for uh, the, the federal government to purchase these lands. Um, the Forest Service partnered with uh, the Soil Conservation Service. Together, um, they restored these, uh, these blown over lands um, into productive grasslands. Um, and uh, in the 1930s, or excuse me, in the 1960s, uh, the Forest Service formally uh, took uh, over management of the, those lands. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier as well, um, range, uh, I think comprises about 89 million acres of the national forest system. Um, and so it wasn't that, um, that big a stretch for the Forest Service to start managing grasslands. Um, they had actually developed some of the first uh, grazing management rules and regulations that other public land management agencies adopted over time um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, and so it was a kind of a natural place for those grasslands to end up um, being managed. Medewin is a little bit different, um, and it's a really cool story, but they're both stories of restoration and, I think, redemption. You know, you have the Dust Bowl, you have this legacy um, that uh, the, the federal agencies, uh, the Soil Conservation Service and the Forest Service were able to, to restore and, and turn back into, into productive, you know, wildlife habitat, productive grazing lands, um, lands that provide a lot of ecosystem services. Well, in Medewin, um, it was a little bit different. The Department of Defense actually owned uh, the 20 or so thousand acres that uh, Medewin now sits on. And uh, it built uh, a couple of huge ammunition plants there. It uh, manufactured TNT um, and built bombs for World War II uh, all the way up through uh, Vietnam until it decided that it no longer needed those lands and uh, wanted to give them away to, to somebody else. And so in the 1990s, Citizen Group came together and uh, and got some legislation sponsored. And uh, a lot of that landscape uh, was given to the Forest Service, where they have been uh, over the last couple of decades undergoing a process uh, largely through volunteers to effectively hand plant um, a tall grass prairie. Um, and so it's just a fascinating story. Um, it relies on volunteers. Um, it, it, it's really that story of restoration and redemption, um, you know, from bombs uh, to bison is, a, is another uh, cool alliterative line um, that I think uh, captures Medewin. And why bombs to bison? Well, the bombs part, we, we, are, we understand. Um, 
in 2016, uh, the National Forest Foundation uh, partnered with the Nature Conservancy and Medewin um, to bring a herd of 27 bison um, to Medewin. They were uh, genetically pure bison from a private ranch in South Dakota. Um, and now I think uh, there are over 80 bison. They've bred uh, every year, um, and it's a huge draw for folks uh, from the Chicago area to come down uh, to Medewa and take that hour, hour and a half drive um, and check out the, the pasture where the bison are located. And it's also uh, a, a bit of an ongoing study in terms of how bison um, can help restore a landscape. They graze a little bit differently than cattle. Um, and so the Forest Service is studying um, how uh, bison uh, uh, forage and, and how bison use the landscape, how, how that might actually help uh, be restoring some of the native vegetation in that tall grass prairie. It's pretty cool. Manewin's a neat spot, even if it's uh, fairly small and, and still a bit of a work in progress. Oops, I skipped over one there kind of quick. One last photo of a, a grassland. Um, this is in Colorado um, on the Pawnee National Grassland. Um, that's a good segue <clears throat> into uh, one of the, the darker chapters of the book um, where I talk about um, the, the intersection between national forests and uh, indigenous cultures here in America. Um, and, uh, you know, th th this is a, a maybe a difficult subject, one that's um, not a lot of fun to talk about, but you know, at the end of the day, um, really all the landscape uh, of America um, did not belong to the people uh, to whom it belongs uh, currently. Um, and so uh, particularly as uh, the country moved west um, and we had those public domain lands, um, you know, uh, Native Americans were, were uh, you know, generally uh, through treaties put onto reservations. Um, Additional policies uh, allowed uh, some of those reservation lands um, to uh, to be parceled out and uh, effectively sold off. And so uh, there were some opportunities uh, during that process where the federal government uh, had an opportunity to purchase some of these lands um, from Native American tribes um, and add them to the federal estate. Uh, other times, uh, you know, white Americans were able to buy them, um, but at times the federal government was able to buy them. Of course, the, the Native Americans were in pretty dire economic straits, so selling their land uh, was something that I think a lot of them felt like they needed to do, though I don't want to put uh, thoughts in their minds. Um, but nonetheless, the, the, the short story here is that in addition to um, just the wholesale loss of, uh, of the North American continent, even those lands that they were ceded through treaties saw, uh, saw reductions in size. Um, and there's a gentleman out of the University of Arizona named Theodore Catton, um, whose great book, American Indians and the National Forests, um, tells this story uh, far better than I can in one chapter of my book. Um, and I drew a lot of uh, the examples and stories um, from, from his book. So I would encourage folks to check that out. Um, this particular photo is from the Badger Two Medicine, which is an area on the Lewis and Clark National Forest. Um, it's considered sacred to the Blackfeet tribe um, that live in, uh, in north central Montana, just on the eastern side of Glacier National Park. Um, and for years, um, really decades, um, they've considered this land sacred. It's on a national forest, and they had absolutely no consultation in how it was managed. Um, and there's a, a longer backstory there that involves mining claim and oil and gas development um, that fortunately never happened, a lot of legislation. Fast forward to today, and... Um, and finally, um, the Blackfeet have a rightful place uh, in the management of this area. Um, they have a direct uh, connection with the Forest Service uh, in managing this landscape. There's a new piece of legislation um, that will permanently protect it um, in, in terms of uh, how it's used and how it can be used. Um, doesn't shut uh, uh, non-tribal members out. Um, so it's a bit of a, finally, a, a bit of a redemption story there um, in terms of our treatment of Native Americans. Um, I'm going to kind of skip through a couple other photos here real quick um, that highlight some of the history um, of uh, the relationship between uh, <clears throat> the national forests and, uh, and Native Americans. Um, certainly the, the Black Hills um, is, is a fairly well-known story um, about, again, how uh, land was promised to Native Americans and, uh, and then uh, those promises were broken. Um, this photo... Um, highlights uh, an interesting uh, agreement that was forged between uh, the Forest Service, um, white Americans, and, and some Native tribes in, uh, in Washington state, actually, though this is uh, from Montana, um, that was about um, huckleberry picking opportunities um, in, in a forest in Washington, um, and, and the handshake agreement uh, that was forged in, I think, the 19... 
thirties even that lasted until the 1990s. Um, and it actually didn't last because, um, the politics or community broke down. It, uh, it, 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 isn't as effective any longer because um, there's no more fire in the forest or hasn't been as much fire in the forest and trees are um, crowding the huckleberry patches. Um, and one really cool story from back in the day that I, I wanted to highlight real quick uh, was uh, a CCC crew uh, from the New Deal uh, time period um, that, uh, that was made up of Alaska natives um, and that um, worked on restoring totem poles uh, in Alaska villages um, on the Tongass National Forest that had fallen into disrepair. And so this program um, not only restored these totem poles, um, but also uh, provided an opportunity for some of the the folks with totem carving skills to pass those uh, those skills down uh, to the next generation. Um, so it's just kind of a cool, it's a very cool um, historic example of uh, partnership between the Forest Service and um, and in this case, uh, Indigenous Alaskans. Okay, moving on, and I know I'm keeping an eye on time here. Uh, you folks have been great, bearing with me. Um, I'll speed it up a little bit. Crowd control, recreation. Um, one, one of the, the primary ways folks get out on our national forests and certainly one of the more complicated, I think, uh, management conundrums for the Forest Service. Um, as a general rule, uh, our national forests are pretty accessible, um, as I mentioned. You know, they're open to almost all kinds of recreation. Um, certainly some areas, certain things are prohibited. Um, um, but for the most part, um, you can find a spot on a national forest where you can dang near do just about anything, um, for better or worse. And uh, the Forest Service, I think, uh, kind of wants to keep it that way. But that's dependent on uh, on us um, engaging in uh, in the right kind of behavior when we're out there and on self-policing. It's dependent on some of these uh, stakeholder groups and recreation groups um, ensuring that, that their new members and new folks out there uh, know how to, how to recreate responsibly. Um, and I'm sure um, probably uh, Mount Baker Snoqualmie uh, looks a lot like this now, actually, parking issues. I'm sure many folks uh, <laughs> listening right now um, have faced something similar um, to this. And, and this photo is from, uh, obviously, from a long time ago. I think maybe, yeah, 1935. Um, <clears throat> okay, excuse me. Moving on. Um, just uh, I'm going to share a few shots of, of recreation, you know, backcountry skiing, something I like to do, certainly uh, lots of opportunity for that. Hiking, uh, this photo is from the Green Mountain uh, National Forest in Vermont. Um, backpacking in the Bob Marshall uh, Wilderness here um, just outside of, of Missoula. Um, this photo is from New Hampshire, um, and, and there's a railway that, uh, that goes up to the top of Mount Washington in New Hampshire. It goes right through the White Mountain National Forest. Um, and then finally, roads. I mentioned roads earlier. Um, that is one way that we uh, both uh, recreate and access recreation on national forests. Uh, another uh, uh, byway here. I think there's something like 10,000 miles of official uh, scenic byways across the national forests. Um, one uh, maybe more contentious uh, national forest uh, issue, I guess, though this cuts across other public lands, is uh, what I call capital W wilderness. So that's congressionally designated wilderness. Um, only Congress can designate wilderness. Um, I tell the story of three gentlemen uh, who all worked for the Forest Service um, well, just under 100 years ago now, actually, back in the 1920s and 1930s, um, Aldo Leopold, Arthur Carhart, and Bob Marshall. Um, and they were all pretty uh, foundational in creating the concept of wilderness um, and in creating the policies around wilderness, though they certainly had a lot of help from a lot of other folks. Um, but I think their, uh, their employment with the, the Forest Service and their influence on the Forest Service um, is a little bit outsized in that wilderness story. And so I, I focused that chapter um, on, on them and, and also uh, a little bit on the, the, the more modern mountain biking debate in wilderness, um, which I'm not going to get into right now. Um, I imagine folks are probably somewhat familiar with this wilderness, uh, given that it's uh, somewhat in your backyard and is stunningly beautiful. This is the Alpine Lakes wilderness on the Okanagan Wenatchee. Um, but wilderness isn't just a Western phenomenon. This is uh, the Dolly Sods wilderness in um, Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia. Um, of course, you've got the Frank Church River of No Return wilderness and the Middle Fork of the Salmon, uh, one of the most iconic uh, wilderness areas in the country. And then, of course, you can't talk about wilderness without talking about Alaska um, and, uh, and just how much bigger it is up there than dang near anywhere else. Okay. Oh, and then, of course, I got to throw in a plug for my 
my backyard wilderness, uh, the Selway Bitterroot, which is just an amazing place. Wildlife. So one of the chapters in the book talks about wildlife. You can't really talk about forests and public lands without talking about wildlife. Um, I focus on citizen science uh, as a way uh, to talk about wildlife policy and the way that the Forest Service manages wildlife. Wait. No, the Forest Service doesn't manage wildlife. They manage wildlife habitat. Wildlife itself is managed by, uh, by states, um, departments of natural resources, departments of fish and game. They actually manage wildlife populations, but the Forest Service and other land managers manage the wildlife. So we talk about that in the book. Um, I had a really cool opportunity to help with this citizen science project monitoring for wolverine uh, on the Bitterroot National Forest. Uh, We'd head up in the winter with our skis and our snowshoes and an old uh, roadkill deer leg. And we would strap that deer leg to a tree and, and uh, put some fresh batteries and a new memory card and a motion triggered camera on another tree opposite. And we would hope that uh, somebody like this showed up uh, hungry for a meal. And uh, through that effort and many more like it around the country, um, we were able to help the Forest Service get some data that it otherwise couldn't get. Um, the Bitterroot Forest is, I think, a couple million acres. Uh, I think they have maybe one and a half or two wildlife biologists. Um, and so it would be impossible for them to do something uh, like this. With hundreds of volunteers in well-organized way, um, we were able to collect uh, five or six winters worth of data, discover that there are, in fact, um, several wolverines that live on the Bitterroot, and there's even a, a breeding pair. Um, all of which is really useful data to have if you're tasked with managing habitat for wildlife and particularly for um, wildlife that, that may be uh, threatened, although wolverines are not technically threatened according to the Fish and Wildlife Service. That's a different story uh, that I do get into in the book, but I'm not going to get into right now. Okay, you can't talk about wildlife without showing some cute wildlife photos, and you can't show cute wildlife photos without including this one, at least in my opinion. And then, of course, you got somebody you probably all are somewhat familiar with, because again, this is from the Okanagan Wenatchee up on the Alpine, Alpine Lakes, a little baby mountain goat. And uh, of course, you know, wildlife uh, also <laughs> includes uh, flora, not just fauna. Uh, this is a bristlecone pine, which are some of the longest lived uh species on earth. There's a spot in the Inyo National Forest in California where uh, the oldest bristlecone pine is, I think, close to 5,000 years old, only 4,800 years old, which is just mind-blowing. Um, and then, you know, size as well and age. This is the Pando Aspen clone uh, on the Fish Lake National Forest in Utah. Um, this thing is massive, and it's considered one organism because aspens clone themselves. So these are all genetically identical aspen trees that have been growing for literally millennia. Um, the bristlecone pine is the oldest single living species, and I think the pando clone is considered one of the oldest uh, organisms on the planet. Pretty cool. Um, also talk about wildfire. You can't talk about national forests without talking about wildfire, particularly to an audience uh, out west like you all are in Seattle. And so I focused the wildfire chapter on uh, the Eagle Creek fire uh, that happened in the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area in, uh, in 2017. Um, talk about that fire, talk about uh, the public response to that fire, um, and talk a little bit about the history of fire policy on national forests, uh, why they're seeing some of the wildfires that we're seeing now. It's not just climate change, but it's also not just historic use and historic management. It's a combination of a lot of different things um, that are driving the worsening fires that we're seeing uh, right now. A lot of it stemming from the big burn uh, or the great burn in 1910 that scorched 3 million acres of Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, um, British Columbia, killed 85 people. Uh, the response to that fire from the Forest Service's side was the out by 10 policy, where uh, effectively they had a policy that any, any fire that, that a, a forest ranger or anybody saw on a national forest um, had to be put out the next day by 10 a.m. Um, that was their policy, and that policy existed uh, pretty much up until the 1990s, uh, after the Yellowstone fires uh, forced uh, ecologists and scientists to, to um, <clears throat> take a harder look at, at how fire-dependent a lot of these forests were. Um, now the Forest Service has a let-it-burn policy, where uh, they basically let uh, forest fires burn because forests need them uh, until, that is, uh, they start to threaten private property or uh, lives. 
And uh, as I'm sure any of you are familiar, you can't do a lot of hiking out west uh, anymore without uh, coming across a scene like this, um, which if you're uh, looking up or across the landscape can be a little disheartening with all the black charred logs. But if you're looking down just a little bit, um, is filled with green and life and, uh, and new growth. Um, and so I think uh, it's good representation of uh, just how necessary fire is uh, to all of these forests. Um, the last chapter in the book uh, focuses on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and uh, I talk a little bit about the Forest Service and, uh, and how they have uh, struggled with diversity, equity, inclusion over the years, though I think really there is uh, some, some strong movement in the right direction there. And I also talk in that chapter about uh, how as a society and particularly a society, uh, or particularly the, the sort of outdoor uh, recreation subset of society um, has been predominated um, by white faces and, and actually even more so by uh, relatively fit white faces uh, for the last several decades. Um, that too is starting to change. Um, and so in that chapter, I focus a bit on gender diversity in the Forest Service, um, and, and I focus on uh, on skin color diversity, um, and I focus a bit on, uh, on how uh, outdoor media uh, represent um, uh, different people and, and how that's starting to change as well. Um, this particular photo is pretty cool. It's of uh, a group called the Triple Nickels, um, the, the 555th uh, Battalion, um, which uh, was a all African American paratrooping battalion um, that was part of the Forest Service in World War II. And they were tasked with uh, jumping out of airplanes to put out fires in the Pacific Northwest um, that were uh, caused by um, the Japanese sending fire balloons uh, up from the Pacific, hoping that they would float over and land in Western forests and start fires. I don't think too many of them ever did, um, but nonetheless, there was an all African-American battalion um, that was tasked with, uh, with fighting those. Um, so these are the triple nickels. Um, I talked about gender uh, gender diversity um, a little bit. This is a, a, a Forest Service Girls Club um, from I think the 1930s, uh, 1939 um, on the Schwamagon Nicolay in uh, in Wisconsin. Um, kind of a neat story there. Uh, and then I think this is a great uh, sort of modern uh, representation of where this Forest Service is now. Um, this is on the Tuskegee National Forest in Alabama, the smallest national forest in the system, only 11,000 acres. Um, um, and, uh, you know, when you when you can get smoky out, um, you can get all kinds of people out. And uh, I think um, when the Forest Service hosts uh, events like this and it invites the community to come, um, I think the community uh, shows up. Um, and, and I think it's heartening uh, that they're doing a lot more of this. Um, I would also like to highlight uh, some recent changes that have just happened in public lands management, um, or public lands management leadership just in the last few months. Um, since I wrote the book uh, for the first time ever, um, the Forest Service now has an African-American chief. Uh, Randy Moore was just appointed um, just a few months ago. And I think that's a, a really cool, uh, cool thing. And I think it gives um, young African-Americans around the country uh, a chance to see themselves in a position of leadership in a natural resources management agency, which I think is pretty special. Um, obviously, you've got uh, Deb Holland as the Secretary of Interior, a Native American, and we've got a Native American uh, as the acting director of the National Park Service now as well. So um, I do think institutionally, um, a lot of progress is, is, is being made right now, and uh, I think that's pretty heartening. Um, I think that pretty much wraps up my presentation. Um, again, thank you so much to Third Place Books for having me. I really hope you all have some questions. Um, I would love to answer some, and I think, oh, I even saved a few minutes to do so. Thanks for sticking with me. All right. Hello. That was so wonderful. Thank you. So we oh, do you. have a couple of questions here. Uh, awesome. I'm going to start with one from Lori, who says, was there cleanup uh, of the munitions and hazardous materials from the arsenal prior to restoration of Midwin? Yes, there was. Um, yeah, the EPA was involved. Um, I have some stats in the book. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but um, yes, it was it was on the uh, the list of Superfund sites. Um, they cleaned all that up, um, and they are now uh, kind of restoring it back to that tall grass prairie um, that I mentioned. So yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. 
so I have another question here from an anonymous attendee. Um, and we still have a few more, few more minutes, folks. So if you have questions or if you're thinking of anything just right now, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A. Uh, we would always, always love to hear from you. Please so do. this... Uh, this anonymous attendee says, could some of the national forests in Alaska and other states that tempt oil, natural gas, and timber companies um, be set aside as additional national parks to protect them from those captain of industry and politicians? The short answer is yes, they could. Um, the longer answer is we're going to need those uh, politicians to, uh, to do that. So, um, <clears throat> The Forest Service can't just uh, give land to the Park Service and say, hey, we want to make this a national park. Um, the president can't unilaterally declare something a national park. He can or she can declare something a national monument. Um, but as we've seen recently, that uh, can generate some controversy. Um, and so really, it takes an act of Congress to make uh, a land transition like that happen. Um, I think probably the the most likely scenario for something uh, along those lines that you're suggesting is uh, for Congress to pass some wilderness legislation um, that covers those particular areas um, and limits what is done on them. Um, and barring that, I think uh, some of those executive actions like uh, a national monument um, could be done uh, by a president who, who might be uh, interested in that. Um, but uh, it's pretty controversial, and there are certainly a lot of uh, folks out there, as you articulated, who, who don't want to see that happen. You know, it's really interesting when you look back at the history of the creation of national forests, um, you see a lot of the same discussions, the same arguments that are made today about how we uh, how we steward our public lands. Uh, should they be uh, used primarily for economic development and natural resource extraction, those of them that that's pro, pro uh, or that that's allowed on? Um, or should they be managed more for uh, ecosystem services, watershed values, wildlife values, and recreation? We still see almost the same exact arguments um, being, uh, be, being hashed out today that we saw 100 years ago um, when national National forests were first being created and national parks were first being created, which I just find absolutely fascinating. Totally. So we have just a few more minutes. I'm going to ask one more question. If anybody Great. has a question in the audience, now's the time, folks. Um, so we had kind of a wild couple of years. <laughs> you had a this book is coming out in, in a strange time um yes. but what will you what will you remember most from your time working on and writing this book mm -hmm. Ooh, that is a good question um hmm. huh, i will remember a lot of hours sitting right here in this attic office typing away on my computer no um that's not a very good answer um you know i think um recognizing how many people do really love these landscapes, I think it is something that, um, that I will remember. And, and I think, uh, I think maybe at the outset, I said, you know, when I worked at the National Forest Foundation, we didn't necessarily think that that many people um, knew enough about national forests. And, and we want, I, we, it was always our goal to educate folks on what national forests are and how they're different than national parks and all that. Um, and that's true. But there is a passionate consist constituency of National Forest fans out there. Um, and uh, having a chance to, to, to talk with some of them and work with some of them as I was doing some research for the book um, and to learn some of their stories and to share some of their stories, I think is, is probably one, one highlight and one thing that I definitely won't forget. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so one last great question from Susan, which awesome. says, where is your favorite place for backpacking? Ooh, for backpacking. Oh, um, gosh, I wish I could, wish I had more uh, backpacking experience to draw from. I, I don't, uh, I don't not have some good backpacking experience. Um, you know, I got to say, I, I just had a magical few days just recently um, on the Lolo National Forest in uh, in what's called the Great Burn uh, Wilderness Study Area. And actually, it's named after um, that Great Burn that I mentioned um, <clears throat> in the presentation. And uh, it straddles the Montana-Idaho border. And and I'm bringing it up because I think it's it's maybe somewhat representative of uh, of our national forests and, and some of these 
these little pockets of them that that um, that you can get to. The Great Burn is about an hour from Missoula. Um, it, it we spent three days there in 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 mid to late September. I think it was like 80 degrees during the day. It was absolutely spectacular. We did not see a single person. Um, and you know, it, my friend drove over from Spokane, Washington. We met at the trailhead. It took him two hours. It took me an hour. Um, we met at the trailhead. We had an amazing three days. Um, and it was just this one small little landscape, um, in the Lolo that's millions of acres, um, in even a broader, uh, landscape of national forests in, in, uh, in, in Montana and Idaho. And, uh, we were able to find, um, amazing solitude. We were able to see really beautiful views. Um, it was just really, really special. And I think, um, for me, that demonstrates, uh, something that's really cool about our national forest. You know, I showed photos of the Alpine Lakes wilderness, um, but probably my guess is just a few miles from the Alpine Lakes wilderness uh, on the Okanagan Wenatchee, which, excuse me, requires a permit. There's probably places where you can go backpacking where you're not gonna see a single person. It may not be quite as spectacular as the Alpine Lakes, but it's probably pretty dang close. And, uh, you know, we could have gone up to Glacier National Park. We could have gone uh, to the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness, and we probably would have seen a whole bunch of people. Um, but we decided to check out somewhere else, and we were, I think, richly rewarded. And so... Um, uh, maybe not as that's maybe not a great trip recommendation. Um, you feel free to email me. I'd be happy to talk more in depth about some of the other trips that I've done. Um, but I think you know if you approach uh, a destination like that or, or, or a, a national forest um, and maybe don't look at where everybody typically goes, but look maybe where people don't go as often, um, you might be able to find um, just a really amazing experience for yourself, like I was just able to. That sounds amazing. It was pretty cool. So, uh, we are at our hour, so it's about time that we call it a night. Um, I'm just going to take this last couple moments to say a huge, huge thank you to Greg. This has been so wonderful, so much information, so many beautiful photos. Um, <laughs> audience members, of course, thank you so much for tuning in. We are so, so happy to have you here. Always, always, always. Um, for anyone who would like to get your hands on copies of Our National Forest, go ahead and follow that link in chat. It is just a few chats up, so scroll up just a little bit and you will see it right there. Um, let us know, of course, what you thought of this event, either in person or online. We always love to hear from you. Um, Greg, one more huge, huge thank you. And with that... Do you have any any last words that you'd like to share? Uh, I just want to thank everybody for for joining us tonight. Thank you, Ali. You did an awesome job uh, hosting and moderating. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, support your local bookstores. If you don't buy my book, at least buy a book. The holiday season is upcoming. <laughs> uh, we need more readers out there because writers need something to do in our little <laughs> attic offices. So thank you all so much. Have a great night. Uh, get out there and enjoy your national forests. All righty. Yeah, everything he said. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so shall we let the awkward waving commence? I think so. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.